we know that one of the predictors of relationship dissatisfaction, mm -hmm. we know that one predictor of relationship dissatisfaction is your perception of the availability of attractive alternatives. Wow. And okay. so what does it do to pick up your phone every day and open up Instagram and see hundreds of beautiful people flashing by your face mm -hmm. every time you move your thumb? The Life of Marn podcast is presented by Mar Dating Club. Mar Dating Club is a matchmaking service that represents New York City's most eligible singles. Mar Dating Club works with professionals who don't have time or interest in dating apps, but still are genuinely ready to find love. We are a boutique firm that focuses on quality matches and guides and coaches our clients throughout the process. Use the link in the episode notes to book your introductory call today. Welcome back to Life of Martin Podcast. Today I have Mac and Murphy back. How are you, Mac and? I'm good. I'm very happy to be here. You just got off a flight from England. Yep. And now you're in the U.S. visiting family. I love it. Mm -hmm. But you usually reside in Australia. Not to blow up. I'm like giving everyone your personal yeah. information. Yeah, yeah. Do you want his address too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. No, but okay, you're studying right now um, or you're doing your PhD right now. Yes. What correct. is your PhD in specifically? My PhD topic is male beautification. So I'm interested. Oh, male in, beautification. Yeah. So I'm okay. interested in the things that men do to make themselves more attractive, which is a pretty understudied area. I mean, there's plenty of beautification research and there's also a fair amount on male beautification. But I would say the overall thrust has mm -hmm. been thinking about women and what yeah. women do. And lately, that's been a very interesting topic for me. So we haven't published anything. We have, I mean, we've done some studies that I, I can't talk about yet because we're still kind of working on them. But yeah. That's so interesting. So what are some of the, can you say some of the top things that men do? Oh, the things, well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I could talk about this a little bit. I suppose uh, one phenomenon that's quite interesting to me is the degree to which men are working out today versus mm -hmm. in the past. Okay. Uh, so it's pretty standard. I mean, bas basically half of young men are living like recreational bodybuilders just to look good, right? Mm -hmm. um, hitting the gym constantly, that sort of thing. Yep. And then you have more kind of niche phenomenons that have recently become more prevalent. I don't know if you've run into like looks maxing online and no. that. Okay, what so is this that? is like, uh, it's very common among young men. It's this set of practices that you do to try and make yourself more attractive. Um, and it started out as a very much fringe, I'd say incel adjacent, and to an extent incel created idea. But now it's something quite different. I mean, the videos on looks maxing will get millions of views. And there aren't millions of incels watching, you know, these videos. So I'd say that okay. it's a, it's a larger phenomenon. But so looks maxing is basically like maximizing your looks. It's yeah. Very, <laughs> very congruent with the name. Okay. Yeah. So cool. all, trying to figure out all the different things that you can do to make yourself more attractive. I find it very interesting as a phenomenon. It's not well understood. And so I'm interested in male beautification generally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's those are a couple specific areas so that's really interesting like we just got some funding from eb to do a study on muscularity which will be very interesting and you know mm -hmm. what influences men's desire and drive for muscularity okay yeah. interesting well you were last time one of my top listened to podcasts um and so we talked a lot about attractiveness mm -hmm. you know how to get into a relationship and today we're going to speak more about, you know, once you're in the relationship. Which is you... fitting because you've you've gotten into a relationship since. Right. So it's good timing. No, and it's I good just. Good timing for a topic shift. It really is. Yeah. It's all just happening naturally. But it's crazy because I just moved in with my boyfriend and it's, you know, it's escalated quickly. Mm. But yeah, so now I'm like, okay, like I just got, like I put so much energy and effort into finding this person, getting into yeah. the relationship. And now that I'm here, I'm like oh, wait, it actually takes work to maintain a relationship. Yeah, the hard part has just begun. <laughs> well, and nobody told me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, and I know you're in a relationship, yep. and I know you don't talk a lot about your personal life, but yep. how long have you been in a relationship? Um, I guess, I mean, we've definitely passed two years. So I, I wouldn't know it like down to the month and day offhand, but I would say two, two and a half years. Okay. Yeah. The official two-year mark is on my Instagram. See, I know, Any, I know I did a post on the day. I love that. <laughs> Any tips? Uh, general tips? Mm -hmm. This is just me being selfish at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's nothing particularly counterintuitive, but I think that 
I think that the kind of right things to do, most people know. It's kind of like it's kind of like exercise yeah. and things like that, where it's like you kind of know what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll do it. Mm. Uh, continue to date them, right? Yeah. Continue to plan romantic things. Uh, continue to invest in them. Uh, compliment them, touch them. All those things that are so instinctive and natural at the start of a relationship tend to taper off yeah. naturally. Yeah. And it doesn't take too much, frankly, it doesn't take too much conscious effort to fight against that natural tide yeah. and try to push things back up. Uh, I so I would say that, I mean, now you guys have just started dating. So all of that romantic stuff is going to be incredibly natural, mm -hmm. right? But four years from now, it's relatively unlikely that it will be so natural. Which makes but, me feel depressed. But well, it doesn't have to because okay. you can still put in a conscious effort, that's right? That's true. It, like in the same way that, I mean, I don't know why I'm using, I think it's because we just spoke about exercise, but yeah. that's the analogy that's coming to mind. Yeah. Uh, it's like when you first start out a new workout routine, you love it. It's mm -hmm. easy to get to the gym. You know, you start at a new gym or whatever and it's super fun. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately you want something that you can continue to do for a while. Mm -hmm. And if that takes a little bit of motivation, I think that's, uh, I think that's fine. If anything, it's more meaningful because you're actually putting an effort yeah. to uh, to be romantic and whatnot. I yeah. agree. That's that's a cool way to look at it. Yeah. And so talking about a healthy relationship, I also want to go into cheating. For me, it's like I feel like it's too early to worry about cheating because I feel like I'm still kind of in the honeymoon phase. Yeah. But I do want to get into it because I know a lot of people, a lot of my audience have, you know, experienced it in different capacities. I know that you studied it extensively. Um, so before we get into cheating, though, what is the function of jealousy and should people actually try to manage it or is it actually healthy to be jealous? Yeah, well, jealousy is a natural evolved emotion. I mean, a, a lot of people want to treat jealousy as a kind of social pathology, mm -hmm. right? Like it's this socially constructed idea. And, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, there was no jealousy, that kind of thing. A lot of people have this in their head. It's very unlikely that's true. Jealousy is something that we see across cultures. Okay. And most importantly, jealousy is an emotion that we see even in cultures, even in cultures where it's discouraged. Yep. So if it's socially constructed, it's quite interesting that in the societies where jealousy is considered very bad, yep. uh, we still see it pop up. Okay. So that's, uh, that, that's the first thing to consider is that it is a natural emotion. And what's the function, right? Because when we have an evolved emotion like disgust, for example, right? Disgust keeps us safe from pathogens, right? Mm -hmm. The feeling of being grossed out when you see something that could infect you. Yep. Uh, that, that's a, uh, an emotion that keeps you safe. Jealousy, similarly, seems to keep us safe from infidelity. If we're talking about romantic and sexual yes. jealousy. Yes. And there are some what you might call design features inherent to this. Okay. Uh, so it varies across cultures, but... In general, uh, men are more concerned with uh, men are more concerned with sexual jealousy, right? Okay. And women relative to women, right? And women relative to men are more concerned with emotional jealousy, emotional infidelity. Yep. So there's the you know there's the kind of classic saying. It's a bit of a meme, and it's not entirely true, but there's some truth to it that after an affair, a man's first question is, did you sleep with him, right? And a okay. woman's first question is, do you love her, right? Wait, that's so true. Right, I mean, that's, <laughs> kind of the, that's kind of the folk idea that bounces around a lot, and I think there is a lot of truth to it. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely true. There are gonna be plenty of women who are more sexually jealous than emotionally jealous, and plenty of men who are more concerned with the emotional side of things. But the basic idea is that men have a problem with paternity certainty, where they don't necessarily know whether a child is theirs with 100% yep. certainty and women don't have this same problem, mm -hmm. right? And then women have an issue of investment uncertainty, yeah. right? So a man can seduce and abandon a woman. Yeah, right? so if he loves her, then he's probably going to go start a life with her. Exactly. Whereas if he, just, if he just had sex with her, like, okay, that sucks. But yeah. if it's not emotional, okay, I'm still safe. Yeah, so it's not yeah. as much of a threat to the relationship. Now, mm -hmm. important context. I'm not saying that this is the way things should be. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it always has to be like this. Yeah. I'm just saying that from a purely observational standpoint, this seems to be what's going on. Uh, so both sexes are quite jealous mm -hmm. and there are slight but statistically significant 
differences in what makes the sexes more jealous yeah. relative to one another. But that would be the overall picture. Now, you also asked whether we should try to reduce jealousy. Mm -hmm. And I think that, honestly, the the evolved knowledge, the knowledge of the evolutionary, of the, like, let's say, the likely or putative evolutionary function can put a bit of a dampening effect on the actual heat of the emotion if someone struggles with it. Yeah. Because I do think that while jealousy is natural and while it probably is helpful to the individual in some cases, yeah. and while it might even signal good things, right, to an extent. So if like your partner- Like them. Yeah, exactly. Like mm -hmm. if your partner was completely not jealous of you, right, it might feel a little bit like, oh, this person doesn't care about me. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that some people do struggle with morbid and serious and excessive jealousy. Yeah. And I think just reminding yourself like, oh, this is just, you know, this is just evolution playing tricks on me. Yeah. Um, like there's it's, no threat to my paternity here. I'm fine. I think that yeah. it's like very validating though. Cause yeah. I think sometimes people are like, don't be possessive. Don't be jealous. Mm. And it's like a little jealousy here and there is healthy because you should have your guard up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, com it would be ridiculous to, well, no, I, I won't say it would be ridiculous because it is kind of a different strokes for different folks mm -hmm. situation. But I would say that it would be highly unusual to be completely non-fussed about yep. your partner's interactions with the opposite sex. That would that would be a very unusual thing for a monogamous pair bonding mammal to okay. not care about. Okay, no, that makes sense. So what is verbal mate guarding? Because verbal is mate that guarding, a form? Yeah. I've never heard of this yeah. until you. So maybe yeah. just tell us what it is. Well, I must have... <laughs> I must have said that phrase offhand at some point and someone, someone's picked up on it. But Yeah. Uh, so mate guarding comes in many forms, mm -hmm. right? It, it's something that we see in animals. It's the suite of behaviors that individuals engage in in order to stop their mate from defecting mm -hmm. or straying. Yeah. Right? And you can think of jealousy as the emotion that motivates mate guarding behaviors mm -hmm. in the same way that disgust might motivate avoidance behaviors. Right. right? You see a spider, might, you, you Yeah, you're off. like, oh, this yeah. could, this, yeah, this could be, yeah. So fear, yes. right? That's a, that's another emotion that's mm -hmm. helpful. Uh, we evolved in a context where there were plenty of infectious animals and things like that, mm -hmm. so, or yeah. um, venomous animals. And so it, 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 it is, it is interesting how much more likely we, more likely we are to be scared of snakes and spiders mm -hmm. than, uh, panda bears and yep. hamsters, right? Totally. Yep. Uh, and that that also makes sense. Although I won't, you know, there could be some cultural thing going on there as well. I That's not a literature literature that I've looked at. Uh, but in any case, uh, what were we? We were talking about mate guarding. Mate or, guarding, no, verbal no, no. mate guarding. Yeah, yeah. verbal mate guarding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So mate guarding comes in many forms. Um, and in humans, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say uniquely, mm. but certainly rarely as an example in the animal kingdom. We are a rare example and the only example I know of where we communicate information with our mouths mm -hmm. that acts as a mate guarding tool. Okay. So some of this is, you know, some forms of mate guarding, verbal mate guarding are considered, you know, very normal and and almost trivial. Yeah. Like they're so they're so expected, like saying something like, Oh, if you ever cheat on me, I'll leave you immediately. Right. Ooh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. So that's a form of verbal mate guarding because you're putting the information in their brain that says, look, if you cross this boundary, this is the I consequence. mean, yeah, this is the yeah. consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, you're threatening them, not in a, in a scary or a legal way, but yeah. you are threatening them. You're yeah. threatening a consequence uh, for them defecting. So that, mm -hmm. that's, that's a form of mate guarding. A more interesting form and one that, uh, Myself and one of my colleagues, actually, uh, August Harrington, we just uh, we just did a study on this, which which was pretty cool. Can't talk about it quite yet, but uh, looking at and it's kind of uncomfortable, but verbal abuse behaviors as a form of mate guarding, right? Okay. Because th this this is very, I some people might find this intuitive. I find it very counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but one of the reasons that partners are sometimes mean to one another mm. is to stop their partner from leaving. It Interesting. seems. Interesting. Okay. So sometimes it's simple. It's just punishment, mm -hmm. right? It's like, if you leave, I punish you by being mean to you. If you try to stray, I punish you by being cruel, right? Okay. Verbally. But some of it is more pernicious. And this comes to me from, 
I'm not sure if he's the originator of the idea, but it's certainly where it f- uh, it's certainly how it found its way to me it was through uh, Dr. David Boss, who wrote a bit about this idea that verbal abuse can function as a way of warping your partner's perception of their own mate value to your oh, advantage. Wow. Okay. So let's talk it's through like that. gaslighting themselves into thinking they're unattractive. Exactly. Okay. So let's say you're a five and you're dating a seven, mm. right? Hypothetically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One is a five dating a seven. Yep. It's very difficult to change you. And I'm not saying that there's any, obje- I'm not saying that this is like an objective scientific <laughs> scale. Like, I'm just it's saying just an that. Example. Yeah, as like, yeah. A, as like a very loose proxy. Let's say you're a, a person of, a one is a person of middling attractiveness mm-hmm. and their partner is quite attractive. Mm-hmm. It would be difficult for the person of middling attractiveness to make themselves as attractive as their partner. Okay. But it would be quite trivial for them to hurt their partner's feelings such that their partner becomes misled about their own mate value and thinks that they're a five as well. Oh my God. So let's say, so if you're a, if you're the less attractive person in a relationship, and I mean, in terms of overall desirability, you're in a bit of an unstable position. Yeah. Right. Because that person can do better. Totally. Yeah. And there's a lot of competition. And there's there. a lot of competition out mm-hmm. there. So one idea is that the reason that we have these toxic behaviors, and again, I'm not endorsing them. I, in fact, I'm hoping that our knowledge of these behaviors can help us reduce them mm-hmm. because they're so harmful. Yep. One potential function is reducing the target self-esteem so that way they don't think they can do better or they don't realize they can do better. Okay. And some, it's, you know, it's horrific, but some men actually do this intentionally now. I don't know if you've heard of negging as a... Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a term that gets uh, passed around in these kind of uh, sleazy pickup artist type communities. No. Where they will encourage you to be mean to a woman so she thinks that she can't do better than you, right? So when you're... Yep. Instead, of, instead of flirting the conventional way, yep. uh, flirting by putting them down... So that way they think they can't do better and they settle for you. Yeah. Right. No, that's crazy. Yeah. Super toxic. Mm -hmm, Um, Very toxic. And I think that awareness of this, uh, I'm not going to say fact, but awareness of this theoretical structure Mm -hmm. can be very helpful to people on the dating scene. Yeah. Because if you consciously are aware of this strategy, well, then when your partner is mean to you, instead of taking it as a signal of like, oh, I, I can't do better. Mm. It would be much better to take that as a signal of, oh, I definitely can, can do, do better, better. Wait, right? That is- and the same thing, like mm-hmm. if you're in the bar and some guy comes up to you and he's, you know, making fun of you or whatever in a way that seems to be trying to put you down, yep. instead of thinking like, oh, I just want this, I just want this guy's approval, right? Mm-hmm. A bit more useful to think, actually, he's looking for my approval here. Yeah. <laughs> and he's he doing it in a very toxic esteem. way. Yeah, right. Because he's saying that I'm better than him. Yeah. This is something very common that we see, at least uh, as an idea, is that people who are, and, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about this from the kind of woman's angle because I recognize that your show has mostly female listeners. Yeah. But in general, this basic idea that, and, and again, this is, this is from kind of a, a bus angle on it, is people who can't provide benefits impose costs. So people who are low mate value and can't provide the many benefits to their partner of being high mate value, they switch techniques and try to uh, cut you down. Cut you down. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, you know, I feel like that's yeah. important to know. Um, okay. So with the whole like mate guarding, how do you feel about like men and like male female friendships? It's interesting. I mean, I definitely don't subscribe to the idea that men and women can't be friends. Mm -hmm. I see that posted a lot. I do too. And here's the thing. I I don't like relying on anecdotal experience. Mm -hmm. I'm very much someone who has a strong affinity for data and whatnot. But in this case, if you're saying that men and women can't be friends, like that doesn't happen. I have friends who are women. I have plenty of friends who are women. Right. And I know for a fact that there's 
nothing underlying that friendship on my end. Yep. And I would bet my life that there's nothing underlying it on their end either. It's like a yeah. genuine male-female friendship. So when people say that they're that that men and women can't be friends, to me, all that says to me is it's like, oh, you don't have friends of the opposite sex, right? That's that's mm -hmm. the only information communicated. Yeah. Because I'm like, there's actually an experience that you've that you don't have, right? Yeah. However, it's also true, and two things can be true at once here, that a lot of friendships are surreptitiously more than that, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. a lot of people report having backup mates. So it's like, if your partner were to leave you, who would you date instead? Or who would you try to date instead? That is fascinating. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, there's even some research suggesting that people get upset when, they, if, so they'll be in a relationship and they'll have a backup mate, mm -hmm. right? Like a work wife or a work husband. Yep. And they'll report that, uh, and I haven't read this research directly. I've just been told about it. So I'll take it with a grain of salt. Yep. But I've heard that they will, uh, that they will actually feel jealous of their backup mate becoming unavailable right so they yeah. will mate guard oh my their God. backup mate who's not their mate i feel right? like we've all heard yeah. that before or like you've maybe even experienced it way back when and you're like wait why do i feel this way yeah. and i think it's a real phenomenon so how do you define cheating in the academic world because some people are like is hmm. it just texting is it kissing is it sex like how is it defined well there's i think there's many ways to there's many valid ways. Sorry, let me just put this down. There are many valid ways to describe cheating and define cheating. Our lab is very evolutionary mm -hmm. in nature, mm -hmm. and so okay, this is gonna sound. This is just gonna sound plain crazy, mm -hmm. but for us, a lot of sexual activity that other people would describe as cheating. Mm -hmm for us would kind of be part of courtship, right? Okay. Because it's, it, there's no pretense of it even being potentially reproductive. Okay. Right. Yep. So I think that most people would consider it cheating if their partner kissed someone else, right? Yeah, for that's, sure. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. for like, I would say that probably you'd get like 90 to 95% of people saying, yes, that would be cheating if my partner did that. Did that. I'm not sure, but that would be my guess. Yeah. But from our perspective, that would be a kind of a form of courtship kissing, right? In that okay. case, yeah. because it's just a non-reproductive mm -hmm. activity. Yep. There's also a view, though, that like you'll often see in research, uh, and we actually just did some that used this angle instead, which is you look at general extra pair interest. Mm -hmm. And so you can measure that with things like flirting behaviors, like how often do you flirt with someone who's not your partner, right? So there's I, I, this okay. is a very rambling answer, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I guess what I want to impress on you is that there are many valid ways to define cheating mm -hmm. in an academic context. Yep. And that's probably for the best because there's many valid ways to define cheating in a personal context as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, I mean, think about it. If, if you're in an open relationship, it wouldn't be it wouldn't necessarily be cheating to sleep with someone else right right so yeah like it's very yeah confusing. and if you're in a let's say a very highly conservative highly sexually conservative mm -hmm. relationship then you could view things like consuming visual pornography as cheating right that's interesting yeah like there's a whole spectrum i mean there are some mm -hmm. people who would say that porn is cheating and i think that that's a relatively reasonable position right there's there's a whole spectrum of yeah uh reasonable ideas that could work for some relationships but not others i'm really intrigued by the porn thing but let's no. i'll get into that in a little bit um but before we do that just how common is cheating is it like 50 percent of people cheat like how concerned yeah. should i be <laughs> about this phenomenon <laughs> well it's not uh it's not randomly distributed okay. that's this, that's one thing that's pretty so a lot of times when people think about statistics, they think about it as kind of evenly evenly and randomly distributed mm -hmm. probability. But let's say it is 50%, right? I'm not saying it is, yeah. but let's say it, it were 50%. A lot of people would think, oh, in my relationship, it's a coin flip, 
right? Okay. But that's not necessarily true because there are so many other pieces of information about your relationship that affect the probability yes. for you. Okay. It's kind of a population probability. Okay. Now, I've read a lot of incidents, studies on infidelity, mm -hmm. and then I've also recruited participants for an infidelity study, yeah. right? And so I'd say that we don't have great data on non-married couples. There, yeah. like, there's some studies on it, but it's not like there's been tons of research on this okay. where we can get like a ballpark view. For married couples, I would say that a, a reasonable estimate would be about a fourth of marriages will experience infidelity at some point by one or the other partner. Okay. Uh, and I think that might be a little bit on the low side, but somewhere around that, right? That's scary. Well, again, not randomly distributed. Okay. Um, and then I would say that it's possible that most people will cheat on somebody at some point, right? Like about half of people maybe will cheat on somebody at some point, but that doesn't mean that they'll cheat in every relationship. I mean, that would count like people have tons of relationships throughout their lives. Yep. And so that would count, you know, something that happened in a random, you know, high school relationship or whatever. Right. You can, um, you can learn and grow. Yeah. Okay. So the, and then you, if you were looking at like how common is cheating in any given relationship in any given year, then you get very low numbers, like one, 2%. Oh, okay. Um, but that's for that one year, right? And mm -hmm. it's more interesting to ask about over the course of the relationship. Yeah. Because uh, it is the sort of thing that for many people only needs to happen once for it mm -hmm. to be a disaster. And then it ends the relationship yeah. usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at what point do people usually cheat? Is it like the seven-year mark? Because mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of married couples. When are people cheating in the course of a relationship, or does that vary? That's a very good question. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. And get back okay. To yeah. yeah that's no. I, I haven't asked that before. That's a that's a cool one. Uh, I would be surprised if there was a peak early, though, uh, given all the kind of honeymoon things yes. that we were discussing. I, I think that would be quite incongruent. But I also haven't seen. I'm trying to imagine a graph, and nothing's coming to mind. Yeah. So. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Is there a cheating gene or like I heard you talk about this before. Mm. Is there a cheating gene? Is it like passed down from your parents or how does that all work? Yeah. So there's not a cheating gene. This is this is something that I think it comes from our high school biology understanding of genetics. Okay. Right. That it's like mm -hmm. we all kind of did the little experiments with the eye color and things like that, trying to understand how genetics work. And the modern understanding, well, the, f the first thing to know is that eye color doesn't even really work like that from a genetic perspective. Oh, wow. uh, it, it's, it's, it's not just like single genes having, the, having dis the decisive effect in all cases. But cheating certainly doesn't work like that. And I don't think any behavior really does because behavior is so, behavior is so complex. It, imagine genes as and i'm not a behavior geneticist mm -hmm. full disclosure mm -hmm. yeah. uh, i have read a bit of this literature so i feel comfortable talking about it to this extent but it might be helpful it might be helpful to imagine your genome as tons of light switches that are affecting the brightness of a given trait right okay. like the probability of it being expressed and so you might have one that if it's on, well, then there's there's a slight increase in risk-taking propensity, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. And so you've got all these different uh, genes that have tiny effects on your propensity to have an affair. And then those genes come into collision with your environment, yeah. right? The values that you learn, the culture that you're in, the opportunities that you happen to get in life, right. that sort of thing, the relationship that you happen to be in. Mm -hmm. And those all come together to create a kind of probability of infidelity, let's say, or, or a degree of explanation of variance in infidelity, uh, which is a different thing. So I would say that there's certainly a genetic component mm -hmm. to a person's propensity to cheat. Uh, there have been some twin studies that have looked into this and found that it's quite heritable. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, between 30 and 60% uh, would be quite common. Okay. Meaning that genetics do have an influence on a person's likelihood of cheating. And I'm guessing that's just from the dad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because there, there have been some 
there have been some, some there has been a line of research that's looked into whether the genes that cause infidelity in women are the yeah. same as the genes that cause Ooh, infidelity in men. Okay. And they seem to be different. So I know a lot of people, like we try to control everything in our current day and age. And obviously you really can't control if someone's going to cheat on you or not. Like it's someone else's behavior. What are some early signs or early tells that he or she is a cheater if you're dating? Well, I think that the points that you made up front are very helpful and true, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like you can't control it. And right. so, and you also can't game it by, I think that one thing that I've done in past podcasts is share risk factors for infidelity. Mm -hmm. And they all are, in a conventional sense, red flags yeah. or orange flags or whatever, right? Yep. Where it's like, oh, this is a this is a warning sign that maybe this person isn't optimally faithful. Yep. But I think that what you said is also very helpful in the sense that at the end of the day, it is largely out of your control. Mm -hmm. And then also from a pragmatic perspective, how willing are we to act on these red flags? But I think that one general thing to look out for mm -hmm. is extra pair interest, right? Okay, what so does that mean? Interest in other people. Okay. And then also interest in casual interactions because infidelity ultimately is, in most cases, it seems, mm -hmm. a form of uncommitted mating. Yep. And there is some research that, or there's actually quite a bit of research that indicates that sociosexuality, right, a person's interest in uncommitted mating predicts their future infidelity. Okay. And a person's, you know, number of past partners, that sort of thing, mm. has a predictive effect on their proclivity towards infidelity. Okay. So I would say that if you were trying to, ch if your goal in choosing a partner was to choose someone who would be faithful, mm -hmm. you would want to choose someone who hasn't cheated in the past, right? Yeah. There was one longitudinal study that indicated that people who have cheated in a past relationship were three times more likely to cheat in their next relationship. So once a cheater, always a cheater. <laughs> once a cheater, more likely to be a cheater. It's, okay, for sure. fair enough. Yep. Because uh, some people in that study, you know, they cheated in a past relationship and then never cheated again. Yep. And then also someone who, you know, doesn't express too much extra pair interest. So when you guys are walking down the street, they're not constantly checking other people out, right? Mm. When you're in a group setting, they're not flirting with other people. Okay. These sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, e even it's surprising, but there, there's even some research indicating that how long you spend checking other people out is predictive in, of infidelity. Okay. So if he is constantly checking girls out, like huge red flag. Well, it's it's a red flag, and it's also very. I think that I think that it's kind of like what we talked earlier about. Uh, it's it's something that we all kind of know intuitively, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a reason that that sort of thing makes you uncomfortable, and it's because it is, you know, a, it is a red flag. It's an indicator. Yeah, it's an indicator yeah. that he's interested in other women. Yeah. Uh, to a to a degree that might be um to a degree that might be threatening. Yeah. And then the last thing would be their interest and enthusiasm for casual sex in general, right? Okay. So there are some people that are really monogamously oriented. They really enjoy long-term mating mm -hmm. and they don't feel comfortable, you know, with sex outside of the con outside of the context of a loving romantic relationship. And then there are other people who are super enthusiastic about casual, uncommitted mm. mating. Yep. And then there's everyone kind of on, on the spectrum along those two places. Yeah. And this is, I'm using the term use loosely here, but this is broadly what we call sociosexuality. Mm -hmm. And so if someone is quite open and unrestricted in this trait, then they're probably more likely to cheat. So I would say the broad thing to look at is how interested in this is this person in other people? How interested... In, is this person in casual sex in general? Mm. And then does this person have a track record of infidelity specifically? I would say that those would be quite the useful things three. to look for. Yeah. Okay. I don't know about top three, but those would be those would be ones that those would, would be certainly, some. I would I would be uncomfortable with those. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, does porn consumption lead to cheating? It's funny because I I have stumbled upon some research that indicates that pornography usage predicts infidelity, 
but there's a few things to say about it. Some people have tried to interpret this causally, right? So they've tried to make a case that it destabilizes the relationship mm. or has a negative effect. And I think that's relatively reasonable. Yeah. The idea that, you know, dosing yourself with images of people other than your partner having sex yeah. on a regular basis, yeah. that that prescription might not be the best thing for your brain if your goal is to be faithful. Yeah. But I can also see a case for it being a completely non-causal relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be just reflecting basic extra pair interest, right? Oh, like, the, like the sort of person who is really enthusiastic about pornography might also be the sort of person who's more inclined and enthusiastic mm -hmm. about infidelity. And I think some people will be resistant to this. And I'm sure that there's a skeptical view in the literature as well, yeah. right? But for me, the idea that pornography and infidelity would have some relationship is very intuitive because it's very hard for me to imagine a person who would be enthusiastic about cheating on their partner mm -hmm. but wouldn't use pornography, right? Yeah. So even though there are plenty of people who I can imagine using porn and not wanting to, to cheat, cheat, right? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of those people. It's hard to imagine the other scenario yeah. where it's someone who really wants to cheat but doesn't have any interest in pornography, that's hard to imagine. However, I know that a lot of people are going to be listening to this with bated breath and feeling that, oh my gosh, Defensive. you know, yeah, my partner cheat my partner uses pornography. Like, oh my gosh, my partner uses pornography, or I use pornography, but I would never cheat. And one thing to keep in mind is that it's even if it is a predictor, so many people use pornography that it's not necessarily a useful predictor. Yeah. So okay. Another predictor of infidelity mm -hmm. is being a man, right? Demographically. Touche. Yeah, demographically, statistically, yeah. being a man is a small but significant or decent sized, but importantly, statistically significant predictor mm. of infidelity. Okay. But it's not useful information to be like, oh, my boyfriend, oh no, my boyfriend's a man. Yeah. <laughs> he might cheat. I mean, right. Well, yeah. That's not that's not a particularly valid conclusion. In right. the same and in the same sense, it's like Pornography usage happens at such a high rate within relationships yeah. that the piece of information that your partner uses porn probably isn't helpful information. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that the converse, right? Like if, if your partner is one of the, uh, let's say you're a woman and you're dating a man who's part of the minority of men who don't consume pornography while in relationships. Yeah. That's probably a green flag. I would say. But the counter is so common that it's, kind of hard to place it as a true know. you know red flag because then you're excluding so much of the dating pool and also you're excluding a large portion of people who use pornography and don't cheat well and i also yeah. wonder about like only fans and social media because mm. i feel like with those channels then you can access the person you can tip them you can um, interact with them which obviously is good for the woman because she's empowered to you know make her own money but on the reverse, it's also kind of a little bit more sketchy, maybe as a person in a committed relationship, yep. knowing your partner is doing that because it's extra pair interest. Yeah, interest. It's such a I'm learning it, all the yeah. words. <laughs> it's a yeah, very good. It's such a it's such a good point. And I actually I should have said this up front. For some people, using pornography mm -hmm. is considered cheating in their relationship. Right. And I would say for a larger portion of people, something like, like I'm not super familiar with the mechanics of OnlyFans, mm -hmm. but as I understand it, it's you're paying for like a personal, in some cases, at least you're paying for like a personal interaction yeah. with the uh, the porn star yeah. or, or whatever. And I think that a large portion of people would consider that cheating yeah. straight out. Like I would not, I would be extremely uncomfortable and would, would definitely well. consider that. Yeah. Like in my own relationship, I would consider that cheating mm -hmm. flat out. Um, yeah. but I suppose, you know, everyone can set their own boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so there's these tools create new areas in which humans have to negotiate boundaries. Yeah. And a really interesting one is actually, so let's say it's pretty cut and dry for a lot of people mm -hmm. that messaging a sex worker is cheating, right? Yeah. 
I think that that's, I think that that would be pretty common. Maybe, maybe I'm completely, you know. No, uh, I'm uh, like the same. Yeah, I yeah. don't want that. I would consider, yeah, yeah, I would consider that. Very inappropriate. Yeah, I would consider that cheating. Yep. Uh, at least for me personally. Yep, same. More complicated, all these, you know, AI chatbots and things right. like that. Yeah. Uh, like I saw it going viral that a lot of women were, um, you know, flirting with the new chat GPT voice, Dan or whatever yeah. his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't seem as bad. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Right, like, it's like, it's there's not, because it's not a real person. Yeah. But on their end, the act is the same. So I don't know. Mm. It's, there's, there's all these new areas where it's going to be very difficult to figure out boundaries around these technologies for a lot of couples. I mean, maybe it's easy with, you know, GPT, but imagine if there was, imagine how much it would feel like cheating if there was a sex robot that could interact like a human conversationally and also have sex. That would feel, even though there's not another person there, I think for a lot of people that would feel like cheating and would be cheating. For me, it would because it would take away my partner's sex drive. Mm. And like, you know what I mean? Even with porn sometimes, if you're constantly consuming porn, you're constantly having sex with a robot. (laughs) Like, how are you going to have any sex drive to like maintain our yeah like internal it would also gross me out yeah it would like that (laughs) as we're talking about like the ai stuff it's like are you not busy are you not ambitious (laughs) like do you have nothing better to do like Like, surely what is happening i'd be like talk to me like please (laughs) like send me some spicy text messages like i'm creative my phone's on like seriously that's that's interesting though so there is a sex recession with gen z Mm. can you speak to this what do you know about it what's going on I don't know. I don't know enough about it to explain it, mm-hmm. but I think I'm going to cautiously say that I know enough about it to clear up some nonsense around it. Okay. Yeah. So, from what I've seen and from what I've heard from people who should know, it does seem like Gen Z is having less sex than their mm-hmm. parents were at the same age. Right. Okay. So there's a there's a decline in sexual activity among Gen Z. Okay. But there's. It's not that there's just a sex recession Mm. in Gen Z. There's like an everything risky recession. So Gen Z is drinking less alcohol. They're partying less. They're committing less violent crimes. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And so some of the explanations for the, let's call it the sex recession or whatever, Mm -hmm. some of the explanations of this have been naturally very sex focused. Mm -hmm. And that might be a mistake, and I think it probably is, okay. because there is a across the board reduction in risky behaviors. Right. So a sex specific explanation, like a mating market specific view, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily capture all that. I mean, maybe it could, but uh, I'm quite skeptical. And then there's also a view that the kind of peak of this recession mm-hmm. has largely passed, right? So it's it's already okay. kind of coming around. That's great news. And I've also read that it's largely driven by the by the youngest members of Gen Z. So it's not that everyone in Gen Z is having less sex. Mm-hmm. It's that younger people are delaying sex for longer. Mm-hmm. And that's creating the illusion of much higher sexlessness when it might only be slightly higher sexlessness. So that's, um, that's the, kind of the first category. The second thing that would be worth talking about is that There's a very common meme based on a single data point from a single year of one survey, which suggested that this is the 2018 GSS data, Mm -hmm. which suggested that male sexlessness had experienced a spike in young men. So young men were having less sex at an impressive rate. And that data still goes viral all the time. Okay. And I've even seen I've even seen it go viral where people have made up data, they've photoshopped it to uh, extrapolate the trend yeah. and pretended that it's gone from like 25% sexlessness in mm-hmm. young males to 50%, right? But this ignores the fact. It ignores a few facts. So this ignores a few facts. First, the next two years of data showed a return to normalcy. And in fact, the 2021 data actually mm-hmm. showed an analogous spike in female sexlessness, right? Oh, wow. So there was, there was an opposite spike. Okay. 
followed by, again, a return to normalcy. Mm -hmm. And then other data sets with larger samples and possibly better methods yeah. didn't show these spikes at all. Okay. So there was a lot of media attention uh, and a lot of social media attention yeah. put on this one data point mm -hmm. and its fake extrapolations that very conspicuously, and I would say deliberately ignored the other data sets that didn't show this spike, the other years of data that showed this spike going away, and the, again, same data set, just a different year, analogous spike in female sexlessness, which also may have been illusory. So the overall picture here, I would say, is that young people are having less sex, but not in a particularly gendered manner, at okay. least in the data that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. I'm totally open to changing my mind if better information comes out. I, I have no dog in this race. No horse in this race? No horse. I'm, I'm looking at a dog inside. There could be some dog confused. races. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't approve of the dog races. No. <laughs> um, but in any case, there, uh, it doesn't seem to be happening in a, in a particularly gendered manner. Mm -hmm. It seems to be part of a broader trend in reduced risky behavior in general. Yeah. And then I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I don't really think it's a bad thing. I like, is it really, should we really be stressed out? that young adults are drinking less alcohol, having less sex, committing less crimes. That kind of all seems fine to me. Yeah, I agree. Why do men lose on dating apps? Well, I think that, I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of cynical about dating apps. I kind of, I don't know. I mean, I've never used one, so maybe I'm being unduly cynical. Okay. I kind of feel like everyone loses on them just in, in different ways. Yeah. But the way that men tend to lose on them is not getting any attention, right? Mm. And one of the reasons for this, I mean, you can see these really dramatic data sets mm -hmm. that seem to show that women get tons of attention on dating apps and men get none at all. Okay. And or a very small percentage of men get all the attention. And part of this is just that the operational sex ratio on these apps is extremely skewed. Mm. Imagine you go to a party and it's almost entirely men, right? At that party, yep. most men will not get any attention from women. Right. That's just a natural consequence. Right. These dating apps are often upwards of 70% male. Wait, 70% are male? Oftentimes, yes. I what? mean, there's, yeah, so they're all mostly, even, I mean, these companies don't generally release their data, but from the estimates I've seen based on, people reporting their use of dating apps, okay. dating apps do seem to be a mostly male environment. So it's just, it's mostly dudes thumb wrestling on their phones for the attention of a small group of women. Okay. And so a dating app is essentially, a, is essentially one of those parties where there aren't that many girls, right? Yeah. And so the guys generally don't get attention. Uh, or a small group do. I had no idea. That's the first thing. And then there's there's a couple other factors that I think are not particularly hospitable mm -hmm. to men. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of them is that in initial interactions, women are less attracted to men than men are to women, right? Or they're yeah. attracted to a smaller group. Yeah. So most men probably find most or many women attractive. Whereas most women would probably find most men to be not attractive. Because right? women are pickier than men, which I learned from you. Yeah, well, yeah. They're, they're, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would say that in general, women are more selective mm -hmm. and have, um, and, and for good reason. I mean, dating is riskier for women than men, mm -hmm. uh, for one thing. Yeah. I mean, if I were in a situation where I were having to pick a mate from a population of people who was significantly physically stronger and more aggressive than me. Um, and I was also risking getting pregnant with their offspring and having to spend, you know, all, all the resources and effort that comes with that. And I had a body that was more vulnerable to SCDs and SDIs. If I was in that situation, I would also be extremely choosy I about, agree. about yeah. who I chose to date. So I don't, I mean, a lot of, a lot of men, online will complain about women's standards and women's selectivity. But I think it would be helpful to just try your best. If you're feeling anxious or upset about that, mm. try your best to imagine yourself dating as a woman, right? Yeah. 
how Good one. how risky and complex it is. So do you you'd probably be picky too. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the answer is instead of women lowering their standards, is men kind of raising their game <laughs> and like practicing yeah. the male beautification and like mm. becoming more impressive? Because to be honest, like as a woman who's dated, yes, I've dated like the hot guy, of course, but I've also dated guys who are like not conventionally attractive and but they're like really polished and like they're successful and they're ambitious and they have all these other traits. Mm. And so I think women are more forgiving on looks. That's what the data seem to show is that yeah. ma- for for short term mating, there's some convergence mm. where everyone seems to care quite a bit about looks. Okay. And for initial interactions, that mm-hmm. also seems to be true. Okay. But at least in surveys for long term mating, what you're saying seems to be true, which is that women are, are more forgiving on looks or. Yep. We could also kind of spin it another way. Instead of saying more forgiving on looks, we could say that they care more about other traits. Yes, we And do. so those traits mm-hmm. maybe push out looks, right? I agree. So it might not be that they actually care less about looks. It might be that they care more about other things, and that has kind of a pushing effect mm-hmm. on – it kind of squeezes the importance of looks down – because real mating is about trade-offs, right? You pick the best kind of whole package. You can't, yes. You're you can't take one, constantly yeah, yeah you're you can't take one guy's looks and pair it with another guy's humor and da da da. It's, you know, it's, it's not build a bear workshop. You have yeah. to actually pick somebody. It's giving, like, I'm looking for a man in finance. Six <laughs> yes. eyes, blue eyes, like that, yeah. that song. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's actually funny because the, uh, we were talking about evenly distributed probability. I've seen so many people try to calculate how many men fit that criteria Mm -hmm. by just slapping probabilities on probabilities okay but they're not considering the fact that like for all you know and it does seem to be the case actually taller men tend to make more money right for example so it's not evenly distributed like the six five i'm being kind of those are those are ridiculously high standards and it is completely self-sabotaging to have those sorts of standards Mm -hmm. but the, it's it's not true when people have done the math and been like, oh, there's only two guys in the world who fit that criteria. It's like oh, I very much doubt that. I, I doubt because it too. you know there yeah. there aren't that many guys who are six five, but they're probably overrepresented in uh, go you to know, the high East power. Coast. You'll, yeah. you'll find a few. Of them yeah, walk w- walk around Manhattan. Yeah, uh, I've I've definitely seen some six five with blue eyes. That's not that uncommon. Yeah, who no. will probably come for money. Yeah. Um, should single women who do want a partner should they start dating down? Whether it's financially, whether it's, you know, in age and education, mm. et cetera. Like, what's the solution here? I think if you're a successful woman, one of the greatest advantages you can give yourself mm-hmm. on the dating market is trying to cultivate a willingness to date down. Ooh, say more. Well, Chris Williamson called this the tall girl problem, and it, it's a bit of an analogy. So uh, I guess kind of follow this for a second. The A taller woman will generally – so women in general have a preference to date men taller than themselves. And assuming everyone has that preference, tall women are at a disadvantage because a smaller proportion of men are taller than themselves, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And so if as a woman – and I'm not saying all women do have this preference – But if as a woman, you're like, well, I want to date someone who is as successful or more successful than me. Mm -hmm. A hundred years ago, that would have been a very realistic, you know, very realistic mating preference. Yep. And now if you're a successful woman and many women are very, very successful now, having that preference is really nerfing your potential on the dating market. Because if you're, you know, even if you're making a hundred grand a year, being like, oh, I need someone who's making the same amount or more than me. That means that most men are excluded off rip, you know? So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the equivalent of a woman who's six foot three saying, I'll only date men who are my height or taller. It's like, well, there are very few men who are over six foot three. And you're the same age. Yeah, exactly. All these other things too, like educational background. So it would be better to have some flexibility and say, oh, I'll, you know, 5'11", right? Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing with money, same thing with education. Women are becoming more educated than men. Mm -hmm. Uh, Women aren't richer than men, but they could be in the future. Right. And they're certainly, you know, on a on a climbing trajectory in that domain. Yep. And so as the years go by, 
the mate preference of, oh, I want to date someone more successful than me yep. is becoming less and less realistic. Mm -hmm. And so my tentative advice for successful women would be to try to open yourself to the idea mm -hmm. of dating someone who is, you know, less educated, less rich, uh, et cetera, than yourself. Yeah. And, um, and try to find other things to value because realistically, if you've got, you know, if you've got a great career and you're making good money, mm -hmm. you actually don't necessarily need to be dating a man who's, you know, making his making his own money to a significant degree. You know, what? I agree. And I also don't think money is everything. No. I think our culture overvalues money and undervalues other traits like kindness, like yeah. reliability, like loyalty. So if we're talking about, you know, strategically trying to adjust one's own mating preferences. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's not a bad idea as a woman to, if you're a successful woman who can afford to care more about other things, why not care about those other things more? I mean, what a blessing, right? Like if you're if you're a woman in Manhattan making 200 grand a year or whatever. Or like you, a million dollars. Like I have clients yeah. who are making like a million to 500K yeah. a year. Yeah, so if you're one of those yeah. women listening to this podcast and you're making 500 grand to a million dollars a year, yeah. uh, you can afford to date a guy who is hot and fun mm. and you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have much going for him in the way of career. Um, but that shouldn't really matter because your lifestyle is going to be so good just on your own income. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that that's difficult for some people to do. But I also want to point out that based on the statistics I've seen, my advice is not needed here. Women are already adjusting their mate preferences or at least their mating behavior in this direction. Right. So we see that hypogamy or hypogeny or however you want to phrase it, right? That the practice of women dating down mm -hmm. is getting more and more common decade after decade. Uh, th this is true in age, right? Women are more open to dating younger partners than they were before. This is true in money. So in 1972, uh, for example, this is Pew data. About one in 20 couples had a woman who was the primary breadwinner. It's still uncommon, but now it's more like one in six, right? So if you're at a dinner party and there's several couples there, high probability that at least one of them, the woman is the primary breadwinner. Mm -hmm. Whereas before you would need to go to like a conference hall to <laughs> find that Yeah. Um, from a probabilistic standpoint. And then uh, in terms of education, believe it or not, I mean, it, usually people mate assortatively on education. Mm -hmm. So bachelor degrees go with bachelor degrees, doctors go with doctors. But believe it or not, it's actually more common now for women to date down in education than for men to date down in well, education. Well, because women are more educated than men. Because women are more educated than yeah. men. Exactly. Yeah, there's an achievement gap. Yeah, there's an achievement gap there, mm -hmm. yes. So yeah, it's kind of silly for me to give this advice of like, hey, successful ladies, try dating down. I know. Because it seems like the it's successful ladies, well, well, it's all. it also seems like they're already doing it by and large. Yeah. And uh, this is a transition that, I mean, we have sexual norms Mm. that are constructed upon economic norms that don't exist anymore yeah. or are being eroded. And so it might take some time for culture to evolve mm -hmm. to match the new ecology. But I have some confidence based on looking at existing trends that uh, we're going to figure it out and it's not going to be so abnormal for, uh, you know, a woman to be the primary breadwinner and for yeah. that not to be such a big deal. I want men to get their shit together and I want women to open their mind and me in yep. the middle. You know what I mean? Yep. I don't want a slob kebab guy just <laughs> like living off yeah. me. Like that seems a little cringe. Well, they're also, I, I would also say though that think about for, for men who don't have the same economic opportunities, mm -hmm. maybe cultivating other traits that make them valuable. True. So it's not, I'm certainly not saying, oh men, you know, just chill out, do your thing, right? Take your hands <laughs> off the steering wheel. Yeah. But think about like, it's like, realistically, um, like, for, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Okay. So I, instead of going the finance route, I chose to do, you know, academic anthropology and right. psychology, not a field not known for its millionaires, right? That, that's not a very, that's not a very lucrative path. And so when it comes to making myself more attractive, cultivating finances 
you know, to an extent, it's an, it's an option I can make financially decent decisions, right. but I'm never going to be, you know, one of those ballers with a never fancy say never. Oh, yeah, right. social media might change the game. Yeah. Maybe, maybe my, so maybe my, yeah. maybe that sweet, sweet TikTok money will start totally. multiplying, but well, you could get in at like a tech company or like, yeah, like maybe, equity. but I also don't have that much. Uh, I don't have that much motivation in that direction, Okay, but what I can do is I can say, okay, how can I make myself, you know, a more romantic partner? Mm -hmm. How can I make myself a better dad candidate? Let's totally. say a more nurturing person, yep. a more emotionally stable person. Uh, how can I be someone who provides the other benefits that maybe someone who's, you know, locked into a finance job, um, 80 hours a week can't, Love right? That. Like I, like I at least have time to go to the gym, right? Yeah. Like you <laughs> so, are fit. Yeah. You don't have a dad bod. Yeah. Um, I have quick two more questions. Um, do you think that social media has made people think that they can have better, which makes them constantly not committing to anyone? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, there's a constant yeah. scroll and people are using AI to modify their photos. So what you're seeing isn't even real, like yeah. space tune and all of that. Men are kind of dumb, no offense, with people love <laughs> when it comes to like women and makeup and yeah. like, all of that. They've always, they've always been though. It's so funny because yeah. right we have the, uh, you know, we have the kind of uh, the on a survey, a man might say, "Oh, I love, I love the natural look, no he makeup." Doesn't. And then when you ask him to pick the natural look, it's like a caked, make like thirty minute professional makeup yes. job. Like she's yeah. contoured. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, no makeup. It means like at least mascara. Yes. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. same is true for face tuning. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good question. It's like, how is, so we talked about it with pornography earlier. Like it's probably not a good idea to, mm -hmm. if you're trying not to cheat, to dose your brain with uh, like, that seems relatively, I mean, maybe that's not true. Maybe there's no causal effect, but it seems relatively intuitive to me. Yeah. By the same vein, and I mentioned August, my colleague earlier, by the same vein, he came up with this, this, this kind of thought that we know that one of the predictors of relationship dissatisfaction mm -hmm. We know that one predictor of relationship dissatisfaction is your perception of the availability of attractive alternatives. Wow. And okay. so what does it do to pick up your phone every day and open up Instagram and see hundreds of beautiful people flashing by your face mm -hmm. every time you move your thumb, right? Yeah. It's, I don't know, and maybe someone's done this study, maybe there's some data on this, maybe it's nothing to worry about, but if I had to guess, your intuition is likely correct that this isn't optimal for feeling good about your partner. And then also it's like in a, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not like a hardcore evolutionary psychologist, but it is true that during our evolutionary history, we didn't have to see that many people over the course of our life. Mm. And so there aren't that many points of comparison. Yeah. So it's like, how many really, really attractive people would you have seen in your whole life in a savanna, you know, an African savanna context? Right. Probably not that many, right? Maybe a dozen. Whereas if you walk down the street in New York and you see less than a dozen attractive people, you, you must be wearing blinders, right? Yeah. There, there's, there's, there's tons of, in an urban environment where everyone's packed in, there's mm -hmm. going to be tons of attractive people everywhere. Yep. And it's even worse on social media where these algorithms are selecting the most attractive people in the world mm -hmm. who have picked their most attractive photos and then edited them to make them look even, even more, more attractive. attractive. And then those are flying by your face on your phone. I'm sure it has negative effects on, uh, well, I'm not sure, but I'm suspicious of the idea that this could have a negative effect on people's satisfaction with their partner. I think so too. And maybe someone's already done this study and I'm, I'm talking out of school, but. And it just sucks because it's like everyone gets older every, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's no such thing as perfect. And like, there's all these like Instagram faces out there yep. and it's just not real, but people, especially men perceive it to be real. And it's just kind of sad. And then also it's like, if you meet those people, it's like, they don't even look like that. They you know what I mean? Like, like it's like, it's like, they looks like that for the time it took for the camera shutter to close totally they're and flexing their abs yeah like exactly doing the angle yeah the exactly yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it's annoying yeah. stop doing that <laughs> yeah everybody needs to take bad photos to make the rest Please. of us look better could everyone do yeah. that so i can stay happy in my relationship <laughs> just kidding yeah um okay the last one the most controversial topic ever who should cover the bill in a relationship and how should the bill be split well i i mean there's no i i, I come from a scientific background so uh -huh. we're more interested in we're more interested in descriptive claims, like what is rather than what should be. Mm. But I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where 
more and more women are making more and more money Mm -hmm. and making importantly making more and more money than their partner right like i mean we just we just spoke about the statistic that about 16 percent of women are the primary breadwinner in their relationship that's still pretty low 16 it's well it's it's low but that's one in six right so it's not it's not zero right it's like if you meet several couples chances are one of them is going to have the woman making more. Okay. And I would say in those relationships, from my perspective, it seems a little silly for the man to cover everything. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. I think that there's I think that there's a, a discussion to be had here about the fact that in a relationship, women run higher risks, such as pregnancy, right? And if it's an invested relationship, then it's not a risk, it's actually a plan. And so maybe the male should provide more resources in order to kind of compensate for that. Yeah. And then I also think that there's something to be said for the signaling side of things. Like I'm, I'm very gender egalitarian in the sense that if my partner were to make more money than me Mm -hmm. in a, you know, in the context of a long-term committed relationship, I would also expect them to cover a proportionate amount of things. Right. Right. Okay. But In an initial dating context where it's like it's flirtatious and it's supposed to be romantic, I personally would want to cover things just to make it more fun and cool. Um, And like a little bit like courting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Courtship. I think that dating early days is different than a relationship. And I always tell men that a woman, once you're in a relationship, she'll pour more into you than you could ever possibly pour into 100%. her. 100%. Because women are wired to be relational. We're yep. so just like nurturing. It's our like it's in our nature. It's in our evolution probably. Yeah. And so it's like just cover the first two dates and <laughs> yeah. get into the relationship and then like talk about finances and talk about how you want to split things. But I agree. I think that our culture is shifting. Yeah. And I really appreciate you giving your scientific I say it in air quotes because I feel like you also put a little bit of your personal. Oh yeah, this that that that, that last question was entirely but, my personal. No, no, opinion. no. Yeah. But it's interesting. So in in Mackin's world, you're saying what split or cover? Oh, I'm saying for that the man. I think that it. it I think it kind of depends on the individual couple's okay. situation. Okay. I think that if you're a man and you're making loads more than a woman. I don't think it's fair to be like, we should be splitting everything evenly because that's feminism or whatever. I think that that's a little wild. But equally, I think that, I mean, I know that you have a lot of kind of wealthy women clients. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're a woman and you're making 500 grand a year and your partner's making 60 grand a year, Mm -hmm. splitting on rent, right? (laughs) That doesn't, that if you choose to split things like rent down the middle in that situation, you're just going to end up with a severely reduced lifestyle as a consequence. I I think it's more fair to figure things out, but caveat noted in a dating context where you want a little bit of courtship, you want a little bit of romance, getting to the end of the date that you invited your girlfriend on and being like, okay, let's, you know, calculate what did you buy da, 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 da. much better to just swipe the card and swipe hope card. it comes back to you later and just know yeah. that karma is real and it will, it will come back <laughs> i promise yes i've certain i certainly feel like uh, all the money i spent on those early first dates has come back to me in my relationship tenfold I yes, bet. yeah a thousandfold okay so plug yourself where can people find you and what are some new projects you have coming up uh, I don't really have any new projects coming up i i, I kind of just uh, do some research and make videos so mm-hmm. i would appreciate it if people who enjoyed today's conversation did a little google and followed me on various social platforms but no pressure and where what are what's your handle oh uh, my name is mackin murphy Mm -hmm. uh, m-a-c-k-e-n and if you google that all the all the right stuff's gonna come up everything will pop up yeah i've never had a problem with people not being able to find me on socials okay well this was fab thanks again yeah thank you so much this was a good time bye